his group, uh, his group, when they were doing this, redo, redoing the Shining Tree belt, they did some geochron, additional geochron in here, geochronology to get age dates of these rocks. And they did a bunch around the Juby area and into this belt of what has now become known as the Indian Lake Group, which is uh, porcupine age uh, uh, in, in uh, 2 point, uh, 2.6 nine to 2.68 uh, capital M lay. <laughs> okay, uh, billion years. Thank you. Okay, okay. or in this case, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's 20, 2687. It actually runs between 2690 and 2680. The, the next age of groups that are gonna lie on top of that, stratigraphically, would be something like the Temiskaming, which is 2680 to 2670. So one of the reasons why we, when I first looked at these rocks, uh, which was in January of all times uh, this year, uh, we noticed, uh, and uh, other people have too, noticed that there was these jasper, uh, red, bright red to maroon colored jasper magnetite iron formation, sedimentary rocks. And we're going to see a bunch of them today. And you may have looked at some yesterday and not known what you were looking at, but I don't know. Long and short, we're going to see these as fragments in some of these uh, frag coarse fragmental sedimentary rocks. When I first saw them, I said, these are, these are Temiskaming age rocks. And they're Temiskaming-like. Historically, people have called these Temiskaming-like in the last uh, decade or so, not having a handle on the geochron of these rocks. So it became critical, I guess, uh, to understand what the age of these rocks were uh, from the government perspective when they were doing some work in here doing the geochronology to our advantage because now they've identified a belt of rocks here that are uh, slightly older than Temiskaming age rocks. We're looking at rocks that are in the uh, age group of the sediments and some fragmentals that you see in the Timmins camp, which is the porcupine assemblies. And that's where they that's where they reside now as part of the porcupine assembly, which is uh, interesting because that's a pretty prolific environment for gold mineralization in the Timmins camp. Uh, also associated with intrusive bodies uh, in volcanics and in sediments and in the, the, the crisp, uh, fragmental rocks. Um, some of the fragmental rocks are not only uh, sort of felsic uh, pyroclastics uh, but also uh, conglomerates. So. It becomes important as a, an assemblage that is uh, synonymous with gold deposits, not only the, the age of the rocks, but also the, uh, the um, interrelationship with intrusive bodies that come into it. This map here shows the size of this belt that we're looking at that, is, that, we, that we see as being very similar from, the, from, from where we are working on um, the property that iMetal has uh, and going south. Uh, we see a continuity of, uh, of sedimentary assemblages. There is virtually little other than sediments that consist of uh, aronites, fine-grained um, um, clastic, siliclastic rocks, to uh, small pebble, to coarse pebble, to uh, large boulder conglomerates, uh, again hosting uh, gran grit, granul granules, small pebbles, cobbles to large boulders of uh, red um, jasper, uh, which is synonymous with that belt. And also with the porcupine, uh, not porcupine, also with the, uh, uh, with the Temiskaming, because it's, it's synonymous that those same similar fragments are seen in the Temiskaming in Kirkland Lake and in areas over on the Quebec side in the Real Door. So it becomes important uh, as an assemblage that is easily recognizable as being uh, part of a package of rocks where gold mineralization takes place in the uh, in the Abitibi. Um, the thing that's interesting here is that the structure. We lie south of the of the uh, uh, Cadillac uh, um, Larder Lake Break, and with a series of structures that are running north 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 south to north west south east that are offsetting part of that break that goes over to the, as possibly a continuation of the ride out uh, break as we go to the, to the west uh, in the South Swayze Belt. 
So what's important here is this assemblage that is, uh, I'm circling with my finger, I uh, did have a pen. Um, it runs about somewhere in the neighborhood of about seven to eight kilometers long, about uh, two to three kilometers wide. There's the scale bar there. There's five kilometers, I guess five kilometers wide, and probably 10 kilometers north-south at the moment. Uh, what is that thing doing as such a massive block of, of, uh, of sedimentary material um, that is obviously fault, fault controlled to a certain degree? Uh, the Tyrell shear comes to the north end of that near the Juby main zone. Uh, a, no a number of fractures and shears that are coming through here. But we noticed on our, from the drilling that we did uh, on, uh, in, Ju in January, late January or into February, um, on a surface target that we were uh, drilling into nothing but sediments um, of which there was a noticeable um, development of a hydrothermal alteration system and uh, we're not sure uh, exactly uh, the entire dimension of that uh, at the moment it's early on and we're, we're, we've established the fact that we see in, in that alteration uh, a number of different parameters that have be, become uh, continuously uh, seen in from hole to hole to hole in those five holes. Um, not only gold um, over short narrow intervals but also over uh, longer extensive intervals of mineralization but also with a high uh, um, um, presence of, all, of a alteration and assemblage of minerals that include things like uh, uh, silicification, uh, bleaching, um, uh, quartz anchorite stringers and veins, um, sericitic alteration um, that comes in as wisps and as filaments and as, uh, as a patchy uh, alteration of, uh, of, of, uh, with sericite, uh, fine grain disseminated pyrite um, uh, th throughout this hydrothermal system. Uh, it, it becomes, it's geochemically anomalous in gold, but it's also geochemically anomalous in the alteration assemblage um, uh, with carbonate and silica and sericite. The other thing that we do see in, in uh, uh, that is important is the, the presence of sulfide in the drill holes as well as on surface. Uh, the presence of silica, free silica on surface as, as well as in the drill holes. So we're looking at something that's going to possibly give us an IP target on surface, uh, surface for, uh, geophysics, as well as the uh, uh, where we don't see magnetics and we see high resistance right, versus low resistance or low resistance versus high resistance. We can start to see silicification uh, as part of the alteration fabric from the IP surveys as well. The other thing we did here is they, they flew a VTAM survey earlier, later in the year, last 2018, and got the results in 2019. And we started to look at the, the nature of the uh, airborne survey in terms of magnetics, as well as, in, as, well as conductance. And uh, we've identified a number of targets for follow-up along the I-metal, within the I-metal boundaries of, the, of their property. Again, within the Indian Lake Group, IG, ILG, uh, Classic Metasedimentary Lithologies. This belt where iMetal has a belt of sediments that iMetal has a property, uh, is starting to look fairly, fairly wide, and fairly long, and it probably represents some sort of basin. Uh, we're looking at something that's more, more of a, a monolithic in the form of coarse and some fine fragmental rocks. In contrast, as you work up to the north end of this belt, you have a tendency to see finer grain sedimentation, so we're looking at probably the edge of a basin of some sort. We see uh, a, a, a transition from coarse conglomerate as we go towards the Juby, we see coarse conglomerate to fine arenaceous rocks to mudstone siltstones uh, near the Terrell Shear. As we work south, we are predominantly in a, in a, a large block of coarse fragmental rocks that we see to date uh, of, frag of coarse conglomerate, and pebble conglomerate, intercalated with uh, arenaceous rocks, um, and also with some uh, mudstones and siltstones intercalated in some in the drill holes that we drilled. But predominantly on surface, what we see is an awful lot of conglomerate that is altered. Um, from the point of where we drilled 
uh, to some six kilometers, seven kilometers to the south, we still see that same alteration. intrusive dike this is a felspar porphyry if you get hone in here on the, in close up you'll see the felspar phenocrysts which are these little white clubs these are crystals in the felspar porphyry so it's part of an intrusive package of rocks that's coming up into the conglomerate about 10 meters away from us here five or ten meters away on both sides I guess uh, but this is actually one of these intrusive porphyries and to the north and uh, we think there's more we see it on some uh, uh, old maps that were originally uh, showed indications that there was possibility of porphyry dikes or porphyry whatever, blobs or porphyry outcrops. So we want to go in and take, take, take a check on these things. So this is an important, this is part of the intrusive package of rocks that's coming up into this conglomerate uh, assemblage. The Indian Lake conglomerate, presumably these things would be Indian Lake Felspar porphyry plus or minus quartz, felspar quartz porphyry. The significance of these porphyry dikes that we see on surface, if there's a dike, a small dike, we know there's something to the north of us here, we're gonna check it all out. But what they represent is a, is a potential heat source. If there's a, a, a larger body or a magma chamber that's solidified as a, as a, a larger body underneath these, these conglomerates or within the conglomerate package, then these things create heat system to drive a hydrothermal system. And that hydrothermal system is driving a lot of the alteration we see in these sediments, as well as mineralization like pyrite, disseminated pyrite, and or gold mineralization associated with that fluid. So it becomes really important to see evidence that there is a, uh, uh, a heat source in this, in this geological package of sediments. Because what that does, it allows us that latitude to say, yeah, well, there's been some sort of heat system in here that's caused the hydrothermal system to be operative. This is zone three. Uh, this is a zone that's got uh, both uh, finely disseminated pyrite, and you can see the rusty, rusty oxidation of where the pyrite is starting to uh, oxidize out at surface. And you can look around behind you and you can just see all the, the sort of the rusty pods, uh, pods of sulfides that are mostly pyrite. There's also chalcopyrite in some of the areas up in the top here where you have malachite coming through as well. These are basically a fine grained sediment uh, package of, of uh, quartz aronites and conglomerate. And you can see the evidence of the conglomerate right in here. Very peached out, pebbles, fragments, with a an, an arenaceous matrix, silicified rock, very hard, um, cut by stringers, and uh, and the fragment population is uh, again we're looking at uh, fragments that are consisting of quartz, false fragments as well as uh, some jasper bubbles as well. <laughs> 